thanks everyone for coming out to my talk. Uh, it's called Lessons from Co-op, Surviving on the Fringes. Uh, and just a little bit about me real quick. Uh, I'm the co-founder and studio director of Co-op. Um, my background is in cultural analysis and media studies. That's what I went to school for. And I worked as an organizer and administrator for a research lab in video games. So I have a lot of experience kind of like with organizations and, and how to run them smoothly. Uh, I was also a community organizer in Montreal where I helped organize the Mount Royal Game Society, which was one of the biggest indie groups before we shut it down just this past month. Um, and basically, I'm self-taught, and I'm just figuring things out like the rest of us. So I don't have any formal education or background in making games or running businesses or whatever. Um, so why this talk? Um, I think that there's not really a lot of advice when it comes to how to structure a studio and how to run a game development team. There's a lot of advice on how to make video games, but I think that luck plays such an important part in, in making things that I, I, there's so many things that you can't account for, but one thing that you can account for is your studio structure and how you run your projects. And that's actually something you have a practical, hands-on thing that you can change. Um, and so this is for people who are interested specifically in starting a company and starting a studio that, to make games commercially and sustainably. And while I think unionization is an incredibly important goal, there are other things that can augment that goal and help us reach that point. And one of them is in learning about co-ops and starting co-ops. Uh, also, there are other forms of making games and other structures uh, that are more loose and fluid that some of these things that I'm talking about might not be super relevant uh, for, so just keep that in mind. Uh, so a couple of caveats. Uh, one of them is survivorship bias. Uh, something to keep in mind whenever you're hearing a talk by anybody and anyone's giving you advice is that they're giving you a talk from a perspective of surviving and success, maybe, and that that might not be, like, it might not be the whole story. Um, also, there's a whole lot of luck, privilege, and money that goes into starting any sort of venture like this, like having a studio. And we were really lucky. We had a lot of privilege. And we also had money saved up from previous jobs, or we were able to borrow money uh, from friends and family and things like that. And I think that that goes a really, really long way to becoming sustainable. And it's not really talked about a lot. Um, and also experience level. Like I mentioned, a lot of, like myself personally and a lot of people at co-op didn't make games uh, before we started the studio, which means that the kind of advice I'm talking about, the sort of strategies that we've learned are coming from that perspective. So if you have a more formal training or experience or background, uh, your mileage may vary. So Co-op is a company that we founded in 2012, and just a little bit about it. Uh, we've made a couple games. We most recently released Nog on PlayStation and iOS. Um, that's what it looks like. Uh, we also worked with Square Enix uh, Montreal on an expansion for Lara Croft Go called The Mirror of Spirits, where we made an all-new chapter for that game, and uh, we had full creative freedom, did all new art, music, and design, and it was a really fun project. Um, and this is a lesser known game of ours called Please Don't Space Dog, where you pilot a truck with a, a space truck with your dog. Uh, and it was made for the original doc, uh, Oculus developer kit. And this game actually helped us travel around the world on the festival circuit and get us in front of a lot of people uh, and opened up a lot of opportunities for us that we wouldn't have otherwise had. And that was just about being in the right place and at the right time. Um, but also, we have a bunch of canceled projects uh, that I think were really important in terms of building our visibility uh, when we were working on them and helped sort of open doors and teach us a lot about making games. So, sort of projects like Skipping Stones, uh, Red Rover, and Fledge. Um, we also do contract work, like I mentioned, uh, with Square Enix. We've worked with Cartoon Network and other companies. Uh, and we also do something called Colab which is a fund that we started uh, where we give people a couple thousand dollars, like whatever we can afford at any given time, to work on a one to two month project out of our office where we give them resources, help, support. Um, and what I think is really interesting about Colab is we don't take any ownership over the project. So if the person we're doing a collab with decides to release their game for free, that's fine. If they want to charge money for it, that's fine, the money's theirs, it's not ours. Um, it's basically a thing that I wish existed for us when we were getting started for as experimental game makers, and it's something that I think is really important. Uh, and I'm gonna talk a little bit more about why you should give away your money if you have it. Uh, this is uh, the first one that we did. It's called Gardenarium by Paloma Dawkins, uh, Kyler, and Ylang Ylang. And uh, this is Orchids to Dusk by Paul Clarissou and Ramsey Harubi. 
And finally, uh, at Co-op, we've done a lot of workshops and we've been involved in the Montreal community where we're based. Uh, and I think that that's been something that's been really important for us as well. So what is Co-op? Uh, I get a lot of questions if it's like an art collective, is it a company, is it a workers co-op? Uh, and I think this is due to the fact that when we originally started, we were really inspired by indie record labels, like music record labels. We wanted to to start a studio that kind of envisioned the, a way of making games where everyone's working on their own projects individually and they're supported by this umbrella name or this umbrella group called Co-op. Um, we found out that because of not knowing what we were doing, that that wasn't really sustainable and we kind of segued into being a more traditional studio structure where we're working together on smaller projects uh, instead of everybody working on their own. And that was just a thing where we realized we just didn't know what we were doing and everyone on their own was a recipe for disaster for us. Uh, so it is a company. It's a federally registered company in Canada, which gives us access to funding. It's a for-profit corporation, essentially. Uh, and we're all salaried employees with benefits, and our goal is to make artsy and experimental games commercially sustainably. So most importantly, we're structured as a workers' cooperative. So we're not actually legally registered as a workers' co-op, and um, that's because when we were getting started, we didn't actually even know about the co-op structure. The name ended up being a happy coincidence. And we also wanted to be a corporation because that gave us access to specific funding in Canada that's really, really helpful, to, uh, that can like give you hundreds of thousands of dollars potentially if you can get it. Um, but one thing that we did after our first year is decide to restructure the studio as a workers' co-op internally. So we changed our bylaws and what that means. Uh, so like, does anyone here know what a workers' co-op is? Okay, a couple of hands. Um, so a workers' co-op is essentially a company that's owned by all the employees. So everyone who's a full-time employee owns the company at an equal level, and that's regardless of their financial investment. So if I put something like $50,000 into the start of the company and someone put in $100, we still own the same amount of shares. And what's interesting is a lot of game studios and startups are actually very similar to co-ops when they just get started. Uh, because you're just a couple of people, you're all working, you're wearing many hats, you're sharing responsibility, uh, but what happens and where they diverge is when it comes to growth. And I think when growth becomes your goal, you're essentially optimizing for money, and that's it. And when you're optimizing for money, it forces a lot of compromises, and it creates exploitation, even against best interests. That's just kind of how capitalism works. So as soon as you start doing things where you have to grow, you're also increasing your overhead significantly. And that means you have to make games that, like, will be able to cover those costs, and you start to make decisions that I think are exploitative because it's inevitable. You need to keep the lights on, so you do things that, are, that like, will harm somebody at the end of the day. So we handle growth by capping it. So we have a rule where we can't grow beyond eight people. And I think capping growth is one of the best things that you can do in this business because at the end of the day, it's a numbers game, and the less people you are, the easier it is to find a sustainable model for yourself. Um, and it also means like when you're adding new people, they are going to become an equal owner, and that becomes really, I don't know how to manage that at a certain size. So staying small and staying sustainable is really, I think, key to being part of a co-op in, in making games. And so what does that actually mean? What does it change? Like if everyone in your studio is an owner at an equal level, regardless of who they are, it changes, I think, number one, responsibility. People who are owners suddenly have this deeper responsibility in terms of the long-term investment of the studio, the project, your well-being, uh, and that impacts their decision-making because they're making decisions in a new way now. Uh, in mind of like what they want out of making games, but also what the people around them that they're sharing in this responsibility need and want. Uh, and it changes money, because it changes how you decide to split money and what to do with money. Uh, and that all has uh, an ethical reaction. And I think those ethical reactions impact things like uh, crunch, which I think there's a lot of discussion about crunch in AAA, but there's not really a lot of talk about things like what smaller businesses do, because I think small businesses, small businesses are as guilty as big companies in terms of terrible labor practices. You just don't hear about it because there's no one reporting on it, right? And there's just like, you don't hear about it as often because it flies under the radar. Um, 
so since no one's reporting on that stuff, it happens in a completely unregulated, uh, without any accountability sort of way. But when you have a co-op and, and you have things like crunch, you are actually making that decision as a team. And even if it's a bad decision, at the end of the day, you are the one who's profiting from that work not somebody else. You're not crunching because you have to, and then someone makes money and they can either fire you or keep you, doesn't matter. They get to retain whatever the result of your crunch is, and you just hurt yourself in a really significant way for someone else, and I think that that's really messed up. Um, and then profits, you can decide what to do with that as a team. And in terms of health, I think being in a co-op is a more emotionally healthy way to make games, because I think making games actually really sucks and is not a very enjoyable process uh, in a lot of ways. <laughs> At least it isn't for me. And so I think that when you're sharing that responsibility with people on an equal level, you're able to emotionally be more um, cognizant of what's going on. Um, and something that people ask about is like, well, if everyone's making the decisions together, how do you handle disagreements? And I think what people need to understand is that just because you're all owners doesn't mean that you all have to like agree on everything that you're working on. You can have different disciplines and people are trusted to do different things. But overall, because you're all in it together, you tend to find decision making is geared towards the best, like what's best for everybody. And I think everyone kind of agrees on what's best. So we haven't actually had to deal with a lot of disagreements. Um, and also, how do you handle people leaving? To be honest, I don't know the answer to that because in the six years that we've started our studio, no one's left yet. And I think that that's actually a testament to, to the co-op model, that people have this deeper uh, emotional stake in the company and in making games together, that so far no one's left. Um, so I want to talk about some survival strategies in relation to being a co-op. And the first one is the team makeup. So just like kind of what I was talking about, how no one's left yet, part of that is uh, our personalities and our skill sets. But I think a really important thing is the aspirations. Uh, and when you're choosing like who to work with and who to start something like this with, your aspirations are where you see the vision for the team and the studio. And when you come together on that, I think it's more important than any sort of like experience that you might have. I actually think experience is probably the least important thing in making games because, like I said, making games kind of sucks, so you want to do it with people who are on the same page as you. Uh, and when you're going into business with them and you're sharing the, the ownership responsibility, being on the same vision is the most important thing. Um, being involved in the local community actually really enriches and influences the people around you. Like just being one of few co-ops in Montreal, I think we have a lot of discussions in the local community about that model and about that structure and why it works for us and that can influence a new generation of game makers. And I think that there's a lot of intangible benefits that come from being involved in the community that I can't point to any specific thing and be like, we did this, so this made us more successful or more survivable. But I think those intangibles are actually really important to our survival. And something about our team is that we have an art first approach. And I think if it all boiled down to one thing, that that's the co-op DNA, is that our team is essentially, a made, like our, the ownership is a bunch of artists and they're in charge of every decision in the studio. And we make that decision with an eye for surviving and sustainability, but it is an art first approach. And I think that also um, impacts things like what kind of values we have. Um, and one of the things, one of the values that we have is valuing production and having a production model. So as for me, as like one of the key owners in the studio, I am a full-time producer, essentially. I don't actually work on the like, day-to-day the -day making of the games. I am the producer on all our projects and I handle the business side of things. And I think the fact that I'm an owner, but I'm doing that makes me really invested in these projects that I'm not like actually working on in a day-to-day -day basis. And the fact that my team thinks that I'm important enough as an outsider almost to the creative process to be involved really means that they value having someone like, like me around. And I think that that goes towards creating a really healthy model of learning how to actually make games um, and having someone handle all the things that you don't want to handle when you're worrying about design challenges or whatever. Um, and one of the things that I think gets tricky when you have a co-op is how do you shield 
like a team from bad news or something that's difficult? Or how do you shoulder responsibility when you're all owners and you're all sharing in that? And I think, I kind of mentioned this a little bit before, but uh, I think you actually want to silo a little bit. Like you kind of just trust people to take care of things that are their domains and that you don't have to like micromanage everything. So people trust me when it comes to the money. Everyone has access to our bank account and they can check how much money we have if they want to, but they just don't. They just ask me and they trust me to bring up any issues if they come up. And I'm not going to keep anything from anyone because we're all in it together on an equal level. So if I think they need to know about something, I'll tell them. And if I don't think they need to know about something, they trust me to just like keep that to myself. And people talk about siloing in a really negative way because it means it's a breakdown of communication. But I actually think sharing everything can sometimes be an unnecessary burden when people are trying to focus on things that they're, they need to focus on. Um, and a practical like management tool that I learned from my friend Tanya Short uh, at KitFox, and I think that this is a very common tool that I just didn't know because I didn't know what I was doing, uh, is having bi-weekly check-ins with the team that are one-on-ones. And I think what's really interesting with that, it's like you just sit down and you talk, and you're like, how are you doing? How do you, how do you feel emotionally right now? Like, how do you feel about work? What's going on in your life? Are, is, it, is everything good? Are you happy? Is there something that's making you unhappy? And can I help with that? And I think what's interesting when we're having that conversation as equals instead of an employer and employee relationship, um, they don't tell me what they think they want me to hear, right? They tell me their honest, the honest truth. And we can have that kind of discussion as equals. And I think that that really levels the playing field. And I understand where everyone is at and they understand where I'm at on an emotional level and I think that that goes such a long way. Like if I could boil down this whole talk, it's kind of like be on equal levels and keep in touch on your emotions and that's making video games, honestly. Um, and something that I think is bad advice that I heard a lot when we were getting started was just focus on your game, don't worry about building a company. And this might be good advice for some people, but I actually think it's terrible because it doesn't really prepare you for a post-ship reality. And we treat our game development as if every game that we're going to make is going to bring in zero revenue. And that's how I think, that's one of our most important survival strategies is like, if we make stuff and we think it's going to do zero sales, what do we need to do to stay in business? And one of those, and then even if you do think your game's going to be successful, depending on the kind of funding you have, you might not actually see any money anyways because someone else is recouping from your sales. So you need to figure something out. Uh, and one of the things that we do are, is contract work. Uh, and contracts are integral to keeping co-op alive. But they can also be a trap. They can be an emotional trap because sometimes bad contracts happen and you're stuck working on something that you really despise or hate and that can be really difficult. But even when it's good, you can end, end up in a trap where you basically um, do a contract, it pays you fine, and then you're at the end of it and you're like, well, now I need money again, so I need to do another contract and you can't break out of that cycle. And that's something that I've seen happen a lot. Um, so what we do is we split the studio to do both contracting and original work, if possible. Um, and I think that this ties into being a co-op, actually, and, and our ownership, because we're not like contracting out a B team to work on contract work. We're taking like the people that we've been working with since the start and are putting them on contracts. And I think that we trust them to do that, and we know that that work is feeding into this collective pot that's keeping us all alive. And what we try to do is when contracts wrap up is we switch the team that was working on one contract to then be working on original work while the other team that was working on original to take on a contract and share in that responsibility. And I think we can only do that because we're all on the same uh, level and that we all trust each other. And it also means that we're getting contract work that's based on our specific uh, reputation and our specific experience and work, which is really, really important in terms of getting good contracts. Um, and finally, I think I want to talk a little bit about money and how to give it away. So I think one of the things that we do is we have this approach where we take whatever money we have and we put it in to like benefits like healthcare. Uh, we do internship and mentorship programs and we do things like funding, uh, like for co-op, uh, for, for collab, sorry. Uh, and honestly, at the end of the day, fuck money because I think, you know, regardless of how much someone invests, it doesn't really matter because money and capitalism change our expectation of how to work with people. 
And I think that that change of expectation really changes how you, uh, how, it causes exploitation to happen uh, because it creates a class system essentially of who has money and who doesn't. And I think that when you reconsider your relationship with money, you start to reconsider how to have a more ethical and kinder, sustainable way to think about work and relationships with people. And I think that that's a more survivable model that's uh, more emotionally like sustainable in the future. And so at the end of the day, I say fuck money. And that's my talk. <laughs> Uh, thanks, Salim. We actually have some time for questions. There's a microphone up there. Uh, yeah, you remember the repeat question? Uh, hi. Um, interesting team structure. Uh, I think I have a big question on how you actually do make the company decisions. Is it a vote based, or it seems like you guys all have roles? So maybe there's a specific role for making the final decision. Yeah. So the question is, is like how we actually make decisions on a day-to-day -day basis in a more practical sense, right? And I think, yeah, it is a voting-based thing where whenever we have, like, whenever we have small decisions, I'll just like that are in my domain or in someone else's domain, we'll just make the decision and trust. But whenever there's like a bigger thing, we call a team meeting, uh, usually once a week on like a Friday or something, and we get some drinks and have a big meeting for one to two hours and kind of just fill in everyone on what's been going on and then put things to a vote. And we do majority vote and so far in my experience there's almost never been a situation where uh, like we've never had a split decision and when there are things that are a bit more contentious I'll first have one-on-ones with everybody to talk about things and then come together and have a team meeting and then just vote thank you this is a really great talk thank you very much thank you. Uh, I've been actually sort of considering something like this I'm in Baltimore and um, I'm sort of thinking about putting something like this together but one question that keeps coming up is how intellectual property works in mm -hmm. a system like this, in a structure like this. And keeping in mind the sort of the fuck money ethos, like how do people who all own the company deal with, if one person does eventually leave, yep. their ownership of that intellectual property um, once they go? Yeah. So the question is, how do you handle intellectual property when you have this sort of structure where everyone's sharing responsibility and ownership, and what happens if someone leaves? I think that's a really great question, and that's something that we've thought about. And at first, we were really attached to the idea that like IP stays with the individual and is licensed to the company. Uh, and we shifted to a model that is different because certain funding actually requires the company to own the IP uh, to cover like uh, some Canadian funding. Um, so what we've done is, honestly, I think it's kind of an agreement right now that like, because the way our company works, every artist sometimes leads a project and it's their baby and, and you know, we all get really invested in that and we all take on that ownership, but we know that there's a creative lead for every project and at the end of the day, it's their decision what to do uh, whenever there's issues and if they were to leave, I don't imagine us ever working on that project because it wouldn't feel like it's our own. And I wouldn't want to make a game on something that, that I don't feel like I actually own. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Yep, thank you. Thank you. Hi, thanks for your talk. Um, so I feel like I might be the only one who thinks this is kind of like an anarchistic model, <laughs> <laughs> but I really, really love it. Uh, I was just curious how you kind of um, prevent the anarchy other ways apart from just voting um, from like co-op and anarchy seem to be antithetical to each other so what are some more examples and also how um, how do you make up all those spokes like do you have a different type of um, gaming company model wise like you know if you could break down the roles as well Two questions, sorry. Okay, so I think in terms of like how things don't like fall apart into like lacking structure is that I think having a production model is really important, like being a producer and being like, this is how we structure our days and this is what we're going to focus on on any given days. Uh, but I think people just kind of, when I talked about the team fit, I think we're all kind of people who gel really well together politically and ideologically. And so we're all work. we always feel like we're moving together in the same direction. Um, so I don't know if that really answers that part. Did you all start out together? Uh, four of us did. We're now okay. seven people. And so we started four and we hired over the six years three more people. Okay. Uh, and so your hiring process maybe. Yeah. So for our hiring process, it's not like you just get hired and suddenly you're an owner. Uh, right. There's like a six to 12 month probationary period where we often will work with someone, a new hire on their own project, like a small game that's like a one to two months and just feel out if okay. this makes sense for us, but also if this makes sense for them. 
if they want to continue with this sort of model. And then, um, depending on how things go, it kind of ramps up in terms of ownership to, to equal level. Okay, that yeah. like vested type? Yeah, ex okay. exactly. Thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. Hey there. Hello. I'm Dan. Um, question for you. Uh, you say fuck money, and well, that's an admirable goal. At the at some point, you have to have seven people be able to pay their rent and have their kid, yep. kids go to school. How do you reconcile that? Um, yeah, how do yeah. you reconcile that? So the question is how to reconcile uh, a fuck money approach when you need money to survive. Correct. And I think just what my point would be is that I think money is important. I just think fuck money. Like, it's <laughs> like money is really important. You need money and you need to make decisions that bring in money so that you can survive. But once you have an excess of that money, what you do with it, I think, is really important. And instead of just sitting on it and like making our um, runway longer, we'd prefer to spend it on things and give it away if possible. Cool. Thank you. Hi. Hi again. Um, Lewis here. Uh, in the beginning of your talk, you mentioned briefly on your initial goal of going with a, a label like music label like um, structure. I thought that was really interesting, but you said it kind of fell apart, but you didn't go into detail. Do you mind going into detail on what actually was the downfall or the pitfall of it? Yeah, so the question is, is that um, I talked a little bit about being inspired by indie record labels, but how that didn't work out for us, and why didn't it work out for us. Uh, so some of, the, some of the projects that I mentioned were canceled projects. Those were all in our one year of being an indie record label in terms of our structure. And I think it was just a matter of like, I think it's inexperience at the end of the day that, that kind of killed us in our first year with that model. And I think it was a really important model because, because that inspiration like collected a group of people who were like-minded and were inspired by that. But at the end of the day, we didn't really know what we were doing and we didn't realize how overly scoped our projects were. And I didn't know how to be a producer for five different projects at the same time, including my own that I was working on. So if you were to go back in time, would you say the model's still viable, but you guys weren't experienced? on how to handle a model like that, or is it just a bad model? No, I think, I think that that model is really, really powerful and really exciting and something I'd love to explore more. But instead of individuals working on projects, I think it would be very small teams of two to three people and many small teams like that if possible. Thank you for your talk. Thank you. This is the last question. Oh, okay. You said that you handle different financial investments the same. I was wondering if you've had to handle different time investments the same, people that have 20 hours a week versus 60. Yeah, so the question is how we handle time uh, investments across people. So originally everyone was work like we still kind of work all on our own schedules but we have a we have an office together and people have to come into the office uh, at least three time like three days a week. Um, and what we do essentially is everyone kind of puts in 30 to 40 hours a week. And then after that, it's just kind of like, yo, fuck it, go home, it doesn't matter. Because I think it doesn't matter if you're doing 30 hours or 60 hours at the end of the day, it doesn't really change much. Um, so everyone just is kind of trusted to meet their responsibilities in whatever way they see fit at the end of the day. Okay, thank you everyone.